Piccolo from Sapienza, and he will talk about hypertoric varieties, uh, W Hilbert schemes, and Coulomb branches. All right, thank you. Thank you very much to the organizers <coughs> for inviting me here. It's my first time at ICTP and first time at one of these path strings uh, events. So I'm very happy uh, to be here and meet you all. Um, so this is uh, uh, what I'm going to talk today is a joint project with uh, Roger Bielaski, and our first interest was uh, sort of uh, 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 try to generalize some uh, constructions and study of uh, non-compact hyperkeller manifolds in dimension four, which are these DK ALF spaces to higher dimensions. So the sort of full hyperkeller part of the story, unfortunately, is not as uh, satisfying as we were hoping at the beginning. Um, Sort of along the way, we realized that the spaces that we were aiming to study actually have a big overlap with the uh, sort of hyperkeller spaces that arise as, uh, that arise as uh, Coulomb branches of three-dimensional n equal four uh, superunion mills theories. And therefore, as a, a, I mean, the main result that I'm actually uh, going to discuss today is a more uh, sort of uh, explicit geometric realizations of uh, these spaces, which have been de defined by Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima, sort of given sort of uh, more geometric realization of the sort of holom as a holomorphic symplectic uh, sort of spaces. And, uh, and toward the end, I'll say what we can say about the hypercalum metric. So, uh, so recently there's been a, a sort of a lot of uh, sort of progress by Song and uh, Robin Jung and collaborators about sort of classifications of four-dimensional uh, non-compact hypercalor, four real dimensional non-compact hypercalor spaces. And sort of because um, hypercalor ge geometry is so special then, uh, I mean, there's, uh, sort of some features of uh, these classes of spaces that immediately sort of want to be somehow generalized to high dimensions. And so this is the start of the story. So uh, starting uh, real four-dimensional uh, hypercalor, hypercalor spaces of uh, type, uh, type uh, ALF. Um, so, uh, so and let's start, there's two infinite classes. The first class is the uh, case of uh, ALS spaces of type AK, or AK minus one. So, uh, so of course, it's hypercalor geometry, so there's lots of structures. And for example, one can start from simply uh, the complex structure. And so in a generic complex structure, an affine AK minus, AK minus one surface, is just a hypersurface inside C3 with these coordinates. So x, y, z are coordinates in uh, C3, and the lambda i are some fixed uh, complex, uh, complex parameters. Uh, so this is a fine uh, hypersurface as sort of the structure of sort of projecting down to z, gives some sort of C star holomorphic vibrations. Uh, all the fibers are C star except over these uh, special points lambda one through lambda k where the fibers develop a, a, a node. And uh, sort of there's a sort of one is interested in the hypercalum metric then there's sort of uh, this can be constructed also in a fairly explicit way by the Gibbons Hawking, Hawking ansatz so the uh, complex parameters lambda i become uh, sort of points in, in R3, and the sort of four manifold, real four manifold becomes uh, underlying this uh, complex surface, becomes a circle vibration over R3 uh, minus these uh, distinguished points. And, uh, uh, and then if we want to write the metric, actually there's an additional parameter. Uh, there's sort of some scale parameter 
L uh, sort of uh, sort of consistent with what uh, Song has also told us since we're working in non-compact spaces, then just the underlying sort of complex geometrics data don't quite say everything. We need some fixing asymptotic geometry, and so this uh, this parameter is a real parameter that can be sort of infinity. And then, as you know, if sort of this is sort of measuring the size of this uh, circle uh, at infinity, and if uh, L equals infinity, then we have some ALE metric asymptotic to C2 mod ZK, and if instead L is strictly positive and not infinity, then we have a ALF metric. So a metric that at infinity uh, looks like a Riemannian submersion, the base metric is flat R3, and the fibers are circle, uh, circles of uh, fixed length L, this parameter L. Uh, all right, so uh, then there's this other infinite class of uh, four-dimensional ALF hyperkeller manifolds. These are type DK, again, uh, sort of if we forget everything except uh, complex structure, then uh, sort of generically these are going to be, again, affine and given by uh, sort of the generic sort of equation for an affine DK surface. Uh, there's actually, later on it will be relevant, there's a particular subfamily when one of these parameters, lambda i, is set to zero, that uh, sort of is where the equation simplifies. And um, so, so again, this is the complex structure side of the story, and if you want to put a Habakkuk matrix now, it's uh, more complicated because there's no uh, circle action, there's no symmetry, so no Gimbons, Hawking, ansatz. And there's been lots of different ways in which these metrics have uh, been constructed, and uh, sort of one that uh, um, is fine, particularly inspiring, is um, sort of the following one that goes back to uh, San in the late 90s, and then has been sort of uh, made rigorous. No. Mathemat more mathematical sense by recently by Schreers and Singer, and then basically the same idea also what went into uh, an older paper of mine where I was studying sort of metrics on K3 surfaces that collapse to a three-dimensional three -dimensional limit. So it is the following. So first of all, there's some base case that is somehow is very symmetric, and one can prove the existence of this hyper metric just by uh, different methods. So this is the atiyah hitchin metric, uh, so found by Atia and Hitchin in the uh, 80s. So uh, so this is the this this uh, Habakkuk metric on this D0 surface, and sort of at infinity, this has a ALF asymptotic geometry that looks like this. So again, we have our circle vibration over R3 with fibers of uh, some fixed length L. Uh, this is a circle vibration over an S2 at infinity, so it has a Euler class, a degree, which is minus four, and then everything is actually quotiented by an involution that is acting as plus or minus the identity on R3 and as a sort of complex conjugation on the circle fibers. So and this is this DK uh, sort of type of uh, asymptotic geometry, and uh, sort of this idea, each metric actually is not simply connected, so there's a double cover, uh, which is uh, D1 surface, or actually the special D1 surface where uh, one of these lambda i parameters is set to zero. So these are, uh, these are very symmetric, I have, have a rotational symmetry, so one writes down ODEs and solves them essentially explicitly. So we're lucky there. And, uh, and then to construct a matrix for higher k, at least in a limit where this parameter L is very small, uh, we can do the following. So, or Sen actually suggested us to do the following. So we start with a Gibbons Z2 invariant Gibbons Hawking metric. Uh, so now we have 
two K points in R3, put in a Z2 invariant configuration, a parameter L very, very small. And actually we uh, sort of uh, do a gimbal docking ansatz not only with these two K points, but also putting some negative charge, uh, minus four of minus two uh, around the origin, which uh, corresponds to uh, sort of the asymptotics of the atia hitchin metric or its double cover. So, so there's this uh, gibbons hawking metric, so that's determined by a single harmonic function, that's this one. Uh, quotient by Z2 they gi gives us a nice hyperkalem metric that is sort of not, becomes incomplete as we go very near the origin. Uh, and as this parameter lambda is very small, then the ball that we need to remove to have a well-defined metric become smaller and smaller. So what one can do is just glue in uh, sort of everything was chosen so that basically we can cut out a ball and stick in a, a rescale copy of uh, this idea hitching metric or its double cover. And one gets a very good approximation to a Habekele metric and then sort of use analysis to perturb. All right, so, uh, so this is one way of producing uh, uh, this DKLF matrix in a special degenerate, close to a certain special degenerate limit, there are other ways. And in particular, uh, what was uh, sort of inspiration for the latter part of this work comes from sort of realization of these metrics via twister theory and Nunn's equations due to Dancer, Cherkis, and Kapustin, and Cherkis and Hitchin. Okay, so the basic question is uh, that all of these stories seems to have very natural generalizations to higher dimensions. And the main reason is that there is a, a sort of higher dimensional version of the Gibbons Hawking uh, ansatz, which is this uh, special class of uh, hyperkele metrics that are sometimes called hypertoric metrics or toric hyperkele manifolds. So these are uh, four n dimensional hyperkalem metrics that have a trilomorphic action of an n-dimensional torus. So uh, again, uh, one can start more of a, from a uh, sort of uh, um, complex geometric uh, point of view. Uh, so we have a complex n-torus, quotient of a complex vector space by some uh, lattice. And, uh, and then uh, sort of instead of, having, instead of having points in R3, then one needs to fix uh, sort of data that determines certain hyperplanes inside this uh, complex vector space H. So these are special hyperplanes. They can come with some multiplicity. The normals, they must be uh, integer vectors uh, inside, this, inside this lattice. And then there's a sort of constant parameter or masses, lambda i. And then this data on one side lets you define some affine symplectic variety just by taking some uh, holomorphic symplectic quotient of uh, some flat symplectic vector space and this cotangent bundle of this complex torus. So, and again, everything can be done at the level of hyperkalem metrics when. Uh, the, again, what where complex masses becomes uh, sort of uh, parameters valued in R3. And then again, uh, before we needed the extra uh, constant parameter L that was determining the asymptotics, now in higher dimensions, what one needs to fix is essentially a flat metric on this torus. And, uh, and then the sort of picture is uh, kind of similar to the uh, kind of the cartoon picture of this matrix is similar to what we have in the gibbon docking ansatz. We have a, a sort of holomorphic moment map from X down to H star. We have these hyperplanes with normals, these integer vectors alpha i, possibly some multiplicity, and then uh, sort of the picture is that uh, uh, Kind of we have some sort of generic C star fibration. So if you are away from these hyperplanes, then the fibers are copies of the torus D. 
And then if we are at generic points on exactly one of these hyperplanes, then we see something that kind of in transverse direction looks like the real four-dimensional picture that we had before, so one of these uh, AK uh, surfaces. Okay, and uh, uh, right, so then, uh, so this is, so, uh, and the metric again, because it's, it's uh, sort of, that's this generalization of the Gibbons Hawking ansatz, the hyperkelly metric is completely explicit and determined by essentially a, a single sort of function or rather matrix valued function that solves a linear equation, so everything is, uh, is explicit and completely determined by this combinatorial data that I've given. Okay, so then uh, sort of to uh, generalize kind of the Z2 action that appears in sense picture, then the natural thing is to, to look at a finite group uh, acting on this complex vector space so that it preserves the lattice and it's generated by, by reflections so that we are going to see the four dimensional pictures as a, a generic sort of co-dimension four uh, pictures. And so this puts you, puts you immediately in a situation where you basically have a vial group acting on this, uh, the algebra of this torus and the torus in the standard way. And uh, so you have this configuration of hyperplanes that must be invariant under this uh, action of the vial group. And, um, and, um, and, uh, Right, and then you assume that this action of the Val group actually lifts to an action on the hypertoric variety determined by, by these, uh, by these uh, hyperplanes. And then you sort of can imagine a cartoon picture like this where uh, basically you have your sort of hyperplanes determining the hypertoric variety where everything is as before and then, as in real four dimension, we were adding the origin with uh, some negative multiplicity. We, here we can imagine adding these uh, uh, sort of these hyperplanes that are fixed by uh, involutions inside the vial group uh, with uh, negative multiplicity, minus two, minus four, uh, sort of meaning that the transverse geometry there is going to be modeled by Atiyah Hitchin or its double cover. And then you question everything by this vial group and you get some, at least some incomplete hyperkelly metric on some large region that corresponds to this sort of cartoon. And a question would be how do you, when and how you fill in this uh, sort of asymptotic hyperkelly geometry with something that is hyperkelly inside. So, so there's lots of actually non-examples of uh, spaces that are going to have this sort of uh, corresponds to these cartoons. So there's uh, many gauge theoretic, sort of classical gauge theoretic moduli spaces, for example, moduli spaces of monopoles on R3. I think, I think this cartoon, for example, should be the moduli space of um, charge uh, two center charge two monopoles on R3 in the presence of one uh, SO3 monopoles in R3 with one singularity. And uh, uh, so this is one source of examples. And then uh, sort of at some point we realize that actually there's this other big source of examples uh, uh, coming from sort of quantum uh, gauge theories, so these Coulomb branches of three-dimensional quantum gauge theories with n equal four supersymmetries are precisely supposed to be spaces of this sort of type, and sort of why is that? Because uh, sort of if I, uh, sort of we have, we have a complex relatively group, of course we have its maximal torus and vial group, and actually conversely, if we have a torus with this action of the vial group, then essentially there's a unique complex reductively group determined by this data, except for an ambiguity of uh, uh, SO odd and SP, which causes some uh, uh, complications and which ultimate, 
ultimately is related to whether one is allowed to take this multiplicity minus two or minus four here. So, uh, so that's, that's the uh, sort of Lie group. And then, of course, if we have now a, a complex representation of the Langland dual to this, then we get immediately a double invariant collection of this uh, combinatorial data that we need to produce the double invariant hypertoric variety and where, I mean, all the masses, I guess, I mean, one can choose what they are, but in general, we to put them zero. So, so this gives double invariant hypertoric variety, actually a restrictive class of them that we call strongly double invariant ones, where basically all these normals of I to these hyperplanes are actually w, double invariant. Okay, and then from this data, as you know better than me, then there's a, a Coulomb branch that one can associate to these uh, data, and this is supposed to be some Hypercala space, and uh, I guess the, uh, well, I guess if we think about the metric, then also that there was this extra datum of this uh, basically asymptotic flat metric on the torus that comes in and that corresponds in the sort of quantum gauge theories to the gauge coupling constants that uh, come, in, come in there. Um, okay, and then, and then of course, uh, not so long ago, uh, Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nagajima have defined these uh, Coulomb branches as uh, holomorphic symplectic uh, affine holomorphic symplectic variety. I guess the fact that they're symplectic is a very recent result of uh, Bellamy. And uh, uh, right, so then I guess um, when we realized this, then our questions become became uh, sort of uh, well, can we sort of give a more explicit geometric realization of these spaces? thinking about this uh, sort of more cartoon geometric pic pictures of uh, what the Habakkalian metric should look like, which I, I think has also appeared in the uh, physics uh, literature, so nothing new there. Uh, and then also sort of, uh, I guess, a double invariant hypertoric variety is a bit more general than sort of the type of data that one gets from a uh, uh, representation. Okay, so uh, then uh, basically on the holomorphic symplectic side, we were successful, and the constructions that we uh, sort of came up with is inspired by, I think it's chapter six of the book by Thea Hitchens on monopoles where they describe sort of the generic complex structure on the modular space of monopoles in terms of transverse Hilbert scheme, and then sort of a extension of that to the DK ALF spaces given by Cherkis and Hitchin. So in high dimensions, what we can do is the following. So we start with uh, a double invariant affine hypertoric variety X. That's this holomorphic symplectic moment map which is W equivariant. And then you basically want to get some open subset of a particular Hilbert scheme on X, and that's our candidate. So, so what we start with the Hilbert scheme of exactly cardinality of W point in X. Uh, uh, so this is basically some <clears throat> open then subset of where we have exactly cardinality of W distinct points on X and then uh, points are allowed to coalesce and we remember directions and we, they come together. So because we've, uh, so inside here there's the sort of fixed, uh, there's a fixed locus of the W action on here that is going to be lots of irreducible component. There's a union of irreducible components that is the sort of, usually they don't with this W Hilbert scheme. So these are sort of zero dimensional sub schemes where this uh, quotient uh, space is, uh, is uh, sort of the regular, is a representation of W that is the regular representation. 
as I said, this is in general um, made up of various irreducible components. There's a distinguished one, which is the closure of the, of the locus of regular, regular orbit. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, uh, so that's one thing that we can do. And then, uh, because we have this uh, W equivariant map, we can actually have a well-defined open subset inside here, which is this transverse, uh, transverse Hilbert scheme. So, so here, we're uh, basically look, looking at uh, oops, zero dimensional, double invariant zero dimensional uh, subschemes in here such that the image under mu is a scheme theor theoretic um, isomorphism. So kind of in a cartoonish way, this means that if the image of points are coming together in the base, then they also must come together in the fiber, and they're not allowed to come together in a fiber in directions that are tangent to the fiber. Um, so this is this transverse Hibba scheme, and it has a well-defined induced uh, morphism down to this uh, quotient uh, of the sort of Cartan Lie algebra mod, uh, or dual of the Cartan, if one is careful, uh, modulo this uh, Bile group. Okay. So uh, so one can do this, and this has uh, sort of this is a natural holomorphic symplectic structure on its regular part and is an affine variety if we start with an affine variety as we are here, and it's actually regular if uh, the original X is also uh, regular. Okay, so why does this look like to be the right space to look at because of um, sort of concrete examples? So first of all, we can get all of our uh, DK surfaces can be realized uh, in this way, so uh, so for example, so if I start with C times C star and sort of the uh, kind of this projection mu is just a projection to the first factor, Z2 action is plus or minus the identity here and pass into the inverse on the C star factor. So um, I've been calculating actually if one has uh, equations for uh, an affine variety, then it's not so complicated actually calculating the equations for these, uh, for the, uh, for the transverse in the scheme. So actually one can do is a very explicit computation and realize that this space is exactly the, basically the double cover, the, I mean as a complex, so of course we're just looking at the complex structure, so is the uh, double cover of the atia Hitchin manifold, and more in general, if we start with a Z2 invariant, a 2K minus 1 surface, then we get this special subfamily of uh, DK plus 1 surface. So this is good, but we're missing, missing something, and to recover basically the atia Hitchin itself and the whole family of DK surface, then there's a trick. We first need to go to something higher dimensional. So now we take uh, C times C star twice and the Z2 action is just the uh, swapping of the two factors and projection down to C2. And uh, so we take this Z2 invariant transverse Hilbert scheme. Uh, so this gives us this, I mean, this is smooth. This is a smooth holomorphic symplectic variety uh, and it has a, a Hamiltonian sister action, so we can take the quotient, and that's exactly this D0 LF space. Okay, and then you can do the same if you now uh, sort of want to produce any DK surface. You can also do starting with some hypertoric variety of some higher dimensions, sort of depicted by something like this. Okay, so this is the four dimensional examples, and then in higher dimensions, the sort of kind of higher rank analog of Atiyah Hitchin matrix in a way. So if you start with the Codangian bundle of a torus and take this transverse invariant Hilbe scheme, then uh, sort of you get a space that can be identified with the uh, universal centralizer of this uh, Lie group that one gets associated to T and W. So these are pairs 
of an element S in the so-called regular slowly slice to the Lie algebra. So, uh, so this is basically a slice to the adjoint action on the set of regular element in the Lie algebra. And then, uh, and then G is an element in the group that is sort of fixing, centralizing this element S. Okay, so this is basically going to be this uh, C star vibration and then that degenerates along these uh, <coughs> hyperplanes in the H star that corresponds to fixed points of the involution generated by the core roots. Um, okay, and again, if one sort of was this problem that not everything was there, and, uh, but again, you can sort of go to higher dimensions and then take a C star quotient and to get everything. Okay, and then uh, sort of another uh, simple example is where you just take C to the 2n, that's your hypertoric variety with the symmetric group acting here. And uh, so this can be explicitly realized by this uh, sort of matricial kind of explicit uh, affine variety inside, uh, inside this space. Okay, so and uh, basically if uh, your hypertoric variety is smooth, then basically all the local uh, all the local, uh, locally, I mean, all the local picture of your hypertory variety is basically is products of these two, these two cases. Okay, that's why these are some key sort of examples. Okay, so then uh, sort of what we managed to prove with Roger is that, um, so we start with one of these strongly double invariant of fine hypertory variety, where the strongly means that these, uh, Normal to the, it's not only these hyperplanes that are w, the collection of hyperplanes that are invariant under the Weil group, but also the normals <coughs> that can be chosen in a double invariant way. And then uh, sort of uh, basically then, uh, well, we can prove that this transverse simple scheme is a normal affine symplectic variety with a flat morphism down to uh, H star mod uh, W. Again, the fact that this is symplectic is the same result of Bellamy that I was saying before. And, um, and then basically we can compare this transverse Hilbert scheme with the definition of the Coulomb branch given by Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima and prove that they uh, are the same. So when the hypertoric variety is obtained from the combinatorial data of a representation of the langland jewel group, then actually the Coulomb branch as defined by Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima is indeed one of these uh, transverse Hilbert scheme or some uh, torus quotient of them, um, which is only necessary when we work with this uh, sort of uh, special, uh, uh, the odd uh, uh, SO groups. Um, so, um, right, so actually this comparison is sort of, um, um, well, sort of the Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima in their work, they have a recognition sort of theorem for their Coulomb branches, meaning that uh, uh, they have a theorem that says if you find a normal, basically if you find a space that has this property in part one, which is a normal affine uh, variety with some flat morphism down to H star mod W, then this is going to check that the two spaces agree. It's enough to check what happens along sort of points corresponding to these uh, generic points of one of these hyperplanes. So, the idea is sort of that everything else is high codimension and because of normality, sort of the isomorphism over this uh, uh, locus uh, uh, is going to extend uh, everywhere. So, uh, so, so then basically all of the work went here and since neither me nor Roger are algebraic geometry, this took uh, quite a bit of time and effort. So, um, I think I'll maybe uh, skip some of uh, sketch of 
what goes in there and um, instead make some remark and then say what we can say about the hypercal matrix actually. Okay, so the first remark is that, uh, okay, what I hinted at before, so there's slightly more uh, transverse invariant Hilbert scheme than uh, uh, polarized representations. Uh, it's more like the double invariant hypertoric variety corresponds to an element of the representation ring of this, lang I mean, the combinatorial data corresponds to a representation ring, an element of the representation ring of the uh, Langland dual group, but perhaps this, uh, in physics, is already clear that sort of the Coulomb branches actually exist also for virtual representations. And uh, 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 another thing is that, uh, sort of if you think just of the underlying geometric space, there's, of course, lots of different ways in which it can be realized as a, a Coulomb branch already in uh, real dimension four, sort of rank one, real dimension four. So, uh, um, so for example, I guess that makes a bit more complicated understanding. For example, if one is interested in understanding all the possible deformations or resolutions of these spaces, then uh, sort of the fact that some are transparent in one uh, description as a Coulomb branch, and but not others, might complicate things. Uh, so here, here's there's. Um, okay, so, so that's one remark. The other remark is that it looks like sort of um, uh, this transverse Hilbert scheme construction really is some uniform sort of description of spaces that sort of fit in this type of cartoon picture that I explained at the beginning, for example. Uh, so here is probably another interesting example, some Hilbert scheme of points on a AK minus one surface and similar story for the DK ones. So, um, so okay, so if you start with the, so I did here the case of two points. So if we start, or uh, so if you start with uh, um, kind of, okay, so, so first of all, you start with the symmetric product of the AK surface that can indeed be realized as a, um, one of these transverse Hilbert scheme for a hypertoric variety that is essentially uh, obtained this way. So one takes the product of all the AK minus one surface. So in this case, there's two. So we have this sort of gibbons hawking pictures along the two axes. And then you throw in diagonals with multiplicity two and, and uh, symmetry. So if you take the transverse Hilbert scheme of this, you get precisely this uh, symmetric product. And then, uh, sort of what you can do, you can simply just uh, introduce non-zero masses and separate this multiplicity two diagonal into two ones, and uh, sort of this gives you a deformation of, uh, of this space and uh, sort of I guess the uh, feeling the, uh, is that uh, sort of the transverse Hilbert scheme of this is going to be a deformation, complex structure deformation of the uh, Hilbert schemes of the uh, AK minus one surface. Where somehow, so the Hilbert scheme in general, one takes this, so this multiplicity to pl plane, sort of uh, hyperplane corresponds to C2 mod Z2 singularities and uh, so to go to the Hilbert scheme, one does a sort of resolutions of that C2 mod Z2 transverse resolution of that C2 mod Z2 singularity and here instead we're doing a complex structure smoothing. Okay, and then final remark is that actually also the or um, Coulomb branches for arbitrary quaternionic representation also fit into this uh, framework because if one starts with a quaternionic representation, then one gets basically considering half of the weights sort of of the representation. One gets a hypertoric, I mean, a collection of uh, combinatorial data that determine hyperplanes. The hyperplanes are uh, sort of invariants as sort of as a set the normals are not necessarily double invariant. Uh, 
so there is a hyperstoric variety, uh, and then there's a further obstruction to say whether the W action on the base actually lifts to the hyperstoric variety. So in this context, it comes naturally in terms of some uh, extension class for of a, a short of exact sequence of groups, and uh, through sort of work of rather than Finkelberg and collaborators and Telemans who have given definitions of these Coulomb branches in the general case, actually one can check that this vanishing condition is exactly the same as the anomaly conditions that appears in physics. What's a bit less satisfying in this case is that uh, this, uh, the case of groups SO and SP is a bit uh, sort of the solutions that we find of going to something higher dimensional and then quotient in Baratoris sort of works most of the time, but not quite always. So, so it's a bit more unsatisfying. Okay, so uh, right, um, right, that's right. So let me just uh, sort of uh, just make some comments about the hypercalum metrics. So. So if one is interested just in producing sort of complete, smooth hypercalum metrics, then probably the thing that one should do, and I'm hoping to uh, be doing soon, is, well, once you have an underlying holomorphic symplectic manifold, uh, well, because of these sort of cartoon pictures, you can write down some uh, approximate uh, Keller-Ricci flat metric uh, at infinity for for these, uh, for these metrics. So then what you would like to do, maybe sort of com solve a complex motion pair equation with these asymptotics, find a Keller-Ricci flat metric on this holomorphic symplectic manifold, and then use the existence of the holomorphic symplectic manifold to, and basic maximum principle and curvature identities to, <coughs> to show that this Keller-Ricci flat metric is actually hyperkeller. So, so here there's recently, or very, very recently, there's been sort of technical work that allows to do this. So there's Hein as sort of giving a very general framework to solve these complex motion pair equations and non-compact manifold. Song explained how this is non-trivial and it's important to understand uh, asymptotics at infinity. I guess there's been a whole uh, <clears throat> revolution in understanding sort of uh, Keller-Ricci flat metrics in higher dimensions that are on manifold as simple as, as simple as C3. So for example, here there's work of Yang Li that has produced Calabi metrics on C3 that are sort of uh, kind of at infinity as an asymptotic geometry that's very much uh, adapted to the historic picture of uh, C3 that appears also in the talk of, uh, appeared in the talk of Vivek. So this trivial and graph, and then basically away from the graph, we have flat T2, two tori, that of fixed, sort of with a fixed flux metric at infinity, and then this vibration that generated along, along this uh, trivial and graph. And then sort of to deal, I mean, if you want to do this in every dimension, then there's some complicated sort of combinatorial analytic things that you need to keep track of because of these multiple intersections of these hyperplanes as you go off to infinity, but there's been some recent work of Kotke and Roshan from the uh, sort of <clears throat> more kind of analytic type thing to understand sort of how one can do analysis on this sort of asymptotics. So it seems there's uh, everything that's needed, so but uh, <clears throat> So this would just work on sort of smooth or mildly singular cases, I guess. Uh, if you want to do anything, everything, or if you hope that you can maybe bypass some hard analysis, then we entertain the idea, again inspired by what happens in real dimension four, that maybe there's some uniform description of this hyperkeller metric using twister theory and Nam's equations and uh, we got somewhere, but not quite to where we wanted. So, <clears throat> so okay, so in twister theory, the idea is that, uh, uh, so uh, basically the hyperkeller metric is encoded into two type 
of things. So first of all, a twist of space, which is a fibration over CP1. The fibers are basically copies of your uh, manifold with the holomorphic symplectic structure that corresponds to, uh, I mean, we're looking for a hypercalar space, so there's a hypercomplex structure, so every point on CP1 corresponds to a choice of complex structure with a holomorphic symplectic form on, on the fiber. And there's some real structure as well, <coughs> and sort of, so that's, that's one piece, and that's easy to construct, or at least it's easy to construct a singular model for the twist of space of our uh, habica, conjectural habitat metric on this transverse Hilbert scheme, because one can take the uh, sort of Hilbert scheme of the hypertoric variety. This is some <coughs> explicit space. This parameter L actually enters inside the uh, Hilbert scheme. It has basically this, uh, now this holomorphic symplectic moment map becomes a projection down to the total space of this, uh, what's sometimes called the mini twister space tensored with this uh, cartan, the algebra. And then basically you can do this transverse Hilbert scheme construction on all the fibers of this twister space and you get something. Um, so, uh, but what's complicated to get the Habakkala metrics, one needs to find, produce sort of twister lines, so sections of uh, the twister projection with uh, a prescribed normal bundle and sort of the twister theorem tells you that uh, on each connected component of this modular space of twister lines, there's going to be a Habakkala metric there's a far complication is that what the theorem tells you is this hypercalum metric is a pseudo hypercalum metric, so one really should think about producing a, a sort of component of the space of twist line that gives a hypercalum, uh, uh, sort of Euclidean hypercalum metric. And, and then also, basically, from this picture, it's essentially impossible to understand questions like completeness of the metric and, and asymptotics. But so, so then, sort of, we started trying to describe how we can understand twister lines in, in this new twister space. And this is what gets us to, um, to Nam's equation by a series of uh, uh, sort of connections that are sort of more or less uh, well known. So, uh, so first of all, uh, you can think twister, uh, so, so twister lines, first of all, uh, okay, can be can be understood in this new twister space. Can actually can be understood as W invariant curves inside the twister space of the hypertoric variety itself. And these twister lines must uh, be sort of have a projection down to this twister space that is W invariant flat degree cardinal W over P one. And conversely, if you have a curve like this in here, then lifting it up corresponds to uh, trivializing a certain uh, principal torus bundle over the curve being W equivalently uh, trivial. So this, uh, uh, um, right, so, um, so then, uh, so then basically the data of a W invariant curve in here together with this W equivariantly trivial torus bundle, you think of it as cameral data for a coex bundles so on P1 with, so this is a principal holomorphic bundle for the non-abelian group, and phi is just a O2 twisted uh, section of the endomorphism, uh, of the adjoint bundle. Okay, and then once you have this, actually you have a whole one parameter family of this cameral data just by uh, basically tensoring your torus bundle with this particular one that determines by this choice L. And it is understood that sort of if you have a one parameter family like this, this corresponds to basically trivializing all of these principal G bundles that gives you a solutions to Nam's equations. And, uh, <clears throat> and then when sort of 
uh, this bundle for a specific value of t becomes trivial, that means that the solutions to Nam's equation is developing a, a regular Nam pole. Uh, so the simplest type of uh, uh, point singularities for Nam's equations determined by some SL2 triple in the Lie algebra, and here we take the principle. So this is enough, for example, to identify the kind of the vacuum Coulomb branch, if you want, with a modular space of Nam's equations. Uh, yes, it was known, but this is saying that really the hyperkalem metric is, is this natural one. And uh, in high dimensions, uh, basically, the picture that we got to is a picture where you have Nam's equations on an interval with two regular poles at the end and then some jump in the middle. And this jump in the middle is determined by some sort of additional hypercalous space constructed from the data of the hypertoric variety, a sort of, I mean, hypercalous space, conjectural hypercalous space. So there's a twist of space and sort of, but one needs to find, again, twisted lines and everything for this one. So it seems like it's a circle. The only sort of advantage is that this new space that you put in the middle uh, is basically this product of cotangent bundle of Lie groups, which by work of Cronamer, we know how to put hypercalous kind of structures on them, and then spaces that have a sort of more of an algebraic twist of space. And therefore, one can hope that maybe there's a realization of hypercalous quotient or some manifold of a hypercalous quotient. Okay, sorry, I'll stop. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Are there questions? I have a couple. Uh, could you go back to the page where your theorem was? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I was a bit confused about something. Maybe you can clarify. I was surprised you have to do anything at all to prove two, because your description seems very similar uh, to the usual description of abelianization for Coulomb branches. So what is the difference, um, and uh, why, why doesn't that give you an immediate proof of two? Well, but I, I mean, sure, that's... that's um... I mean, I'm not sure whether abelianization, what does this give you? I mean, it gives you this cartoon picture of these, uh, uh, basically, the underlying, this, this uh, uh, I mean, what would correspond to a hypertoric variety where you put these uh, negative hyperplanes. So I'm not sure, I mean, it might be just a lack oh, of okay, my own understanding, but it, I'm not sure if that, I mean, the procedure that then starts with that to give you the actual Coulomb branch. I'm not sure if it's a rigorous procedure. I mean, maybe, maybe I'll show you the ref some references. You could tell me what to say. Okay. But, but my other question was, um, how much more general is your construction than Coulomb branches? Well, as I said, I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, um, it's just uh, replacing, I mean, instead of having, I mean, because when you take this, um, this, uh, uh, weights of a representation, right? You have the, the rules that then sort of, if you take the W orbit of the highest weight, then you need to fill in in certain ways what's inside, right? So... But, but is it important for you that W is a reflection group associated to a Lie group? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That comes, that comes just by thinking of, I take this asymptotic picture given by this incomplete sort of hypertoric metric, and I want some... Uh, I mean, if you start saying, okay, I want a group generated by reflection because the local model is going to be one of these DK surfaces, and then you want to act on a torus, so basically then you're immediately to, the, to a vial group. There's no other, yeah, that's... Okay, thanks. Yes, okay, are there more questions? Thanks for the nice talk, Lorenzo. Um, uh, could you comment?
comment on the possibility of using, you know, sort of, kind of, I mean, these results and previous results uh, for non-compact hypercalar manifolds, uh, I mean, complete metrics on non-compact hypercalar manifolds uh, it, as um, ingredients in gluing, potential gluing constructions in the compact case? Oh, um, well, I mean, sort of, uh, kind of it's clear that, um, um, sort of, for example, if you start with, so I was saying, so there's this picture that is basically Sank's picture of uh, families of hypercalor metrics on K3 that are um, sort of collapsed to a three torus mod Z2 with uh, these configurations of points that is Z2 invariant. So then, for example, if you start taking the Hilbert schemes of points on uh, those K3s and you think about uh, what is happening to the Habakkale metrics on those uh, Hilbert schemes as the K3 degenerates, then <clears throat> you will have a picture where basically these non-compact spaces come in as, uh, that I was talking about, come in as rescale limits of, uh, of these, uh, of these, uh, of these, uh, of these high dimensional hypercalent manifolds, right? So, so conversely, then one could imagine sort of if you start with some sort of basically periodize the base and then sort of understand what is the combinatorics of these uh, sort of periodized hyperplanes that would allow you to sort of imagine some, uh, some metric buildup of sort of pieces that looks like this, uh, this uh, build, non-compact building blocks that are, but uh, I don't have, my, I mean, except for n situations where I know that, I mean, kind of the Ilbe scheme or the Kummer type constructions where you see very clearly what's this uh, picture of these uh, degenerations in high dimensions. Then. Okay, there's, yes. Thanks. Uh, so perhaps he said it and I missed it, but um, so let's say I give you a gauge the uh, a 3D n equal 4 gauge theory. So in your main theorem, you said that there, there exists a hypertoric variety that is the starting point of your construction. Yeah. But how explicit is that? To oh, this is the way that, uh, that, I mean, that you know very well. I mean, you just. Okay, uh, that, that, that's the one. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, except except for this little uh, slight complication in if in the, I guess, if you start with the lang dual group, if there are SP factors, then, um, I mean, then if you want to reproduce this via this transverse Hilbert scheme, then you need to go to something high dimensional first. So basically lifting the representation to SPC and then taking a sister quotient. Um, but I mean, it's essentially the same as, yeah, that you Thanks. know how to produce, yeah. Okay, are there <coughs> any further questions? Do not see any. Um, okay, before we thank Lorenzo again, uh, let me ask you to stay a little bit uh, after we thanked him again for the conference photo, which is, uh, oh, you make a, yeah, okay. sorry. so let's then just thank Lorenzo again, and then there will be announcement about.